This is You and the Law on AM650. Now back to the show. Welcome back. David Hobbs and Ian Girodi from Hobbs Girodi in Vancouver with us on this edition of You and the Law here on AM650. David and Ian are Vancouver estate litigation lawyers with offices in downtown Vancouver on Howe Street. Gentlemen, you've had a couple of minutes to well uh, to respond. Not that this is a surprise or hard question for you. This is what you do for a living. But what <laughs> happens? What happens when someone dies and there is no will? We've talked about administrators and executors and documents and court probate permission and all that's all assuming you've done the right thing and you've had a will so you die and there is no will now what david well there's nobody to to pay your bills to distribute your assets to deal with your estate it's it, assuming there is an estate whether it's a car a bank account a house or, or a combination of things somebody has to deal with those assets and there may be liabilities as well you you may owe some money to revenue canada or 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 uh, the hudson's bay or or the shell gas company mm-hmm. but um Somebody has to deal with that, and if you don't have a will, you haven't appointed the person, the executor, to deal with it. So this executor has to be found now, and and there's a process under the Estate Administration Act, and there has to be a court application brought and an order made of the court appointing the administrator, and we call the person the administrator rather than the executor, but they're the equivalent. Okay. And uh, that's how that whole process now has to take place. And then there's no will for the administrator because the will instructs the executor, but there's no instruction. What do I do? And so the distribution will, the instructions again come from the act, from the legislation, and it tells you how that estate will be distributed. So in British Columbia, Ian, (coughs) if you die without a will, the state kicks in essentially as your executor. There is a an infrastructure in place that says, okay, here's another person who doesn't have a will. Okay, this is what they get. And they get this, this uh, uh, template that everyone gets, including the appointment of an administrator rather than an executor that you could have chosen had you done a will in the first place. Um, yes, the, the, th- there's not... Uh the, the the law, the written law, doesn't put in place an administrator for you, but it provides a process whereby a person can apply to administer uh, someone's estate who dies without a will. Okay. Um, but the act, as David said, the, the act does determine how the estate will be distributed. Okay. And and we often see battles where um, there's no will, and and uh, and there may be siblings or children, and more than one person wants to be the administrator. So they come to court and they file affidavits and they explain what a wonderful relationship they had with the deceased right. and how bad the other person's relationship was and why they should be the administrator, not the other person, and so on and so forth. So, so that a, becomes a dispute. This is a full-on fight. And there's no, they haven't even got into the details of the estate, should there even be one. These are people who just want the right to be at the pointy end of the spear. Can, can happen that way. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, uh, it, it, in the case, Ian, where there, aren't, where there isn't a will, does this automatically mean a more technically involved process and the likelihood of dispute to be greater? Uh, not necessarily. Um, uh, in in some regards, uh, the fact that the distribution is set out by the act um, gets rid of a lot of the gray area that you have with with uh, you know for example the possibility of a will's variation claim. Okay. Um, so, you know, in in that regard, it's it's less complicated. But in terms of just sort of getting the ball rolling and and having someone step forward and into the vacuum that's been left. W- without the appointment of a, a representative, right? Um, that's um, that can be a little bit more. Well, certainly can, is can be more involved than an executor applying for. And it sounds it sounds also like it, it's going to be more time consuming if you've left those details unattended to, and and the state is essentially obliged to come in and and tend to them on your behalf. The state's not going to be in any kind of hurry, is it? You you will just get a number and get in line, and your t- your turn will come when it comes. Well, it's really up to the the people applying to get the ball rolling. Uh, you know, the act is it's just there. It's not like the state is doing anything. Okay. Except providing a, a process through the written law as to what someone has to do to to uh, get on board as the administrator. 
of the estate and get on with dealing with paying assets and or paying liabilities and distributing assets. So we have two terms for ba basically the same job, David, if I'm, if I'm understanding this. The executor is the person who administers the estate appointed by the person who wrote the will. The administrator is the person who also administers the, state, the estate. However, this person has been appointed in many cases by the courts. Correct. Okay, yeah. same the, job. Yeah, and the word executor really derives from the word execution. We, we speak of executing the instructions that are in the sure. will. Sure, okay. That's the concept there. Administrator, you administer the estate. Both people are trustees, which is a more general term of anyone who's been given some things with some instructions and other people have an interest in it and you're we call that the beneficial interest so you have trustee you have the trust assets and you have the beneficial interest Ian if I appoint someone <clears throat> to be my executor and I pass on can it is and there are people in my family who are uh, beneficiaries of my will who aren't impressed with my choice of executor <laughs> not in the least can they apply to have that person removed despite the fact that I specifically requested that individual to be my executor? Can they challenge that? They can, um, and sometimes there's good reason to do so. For example, um, before you pass, there, there could be a, a, you know, the person may have become incapable. Mm. Um, but um, normally a challenge like that will only arise where uh, perhaps a conflict of interest is is identified. You know, perhaps there's a scenario where the appointed executor um, is holding uh, a piece of property or a significant bank account by way of perhaps a joint ownership or right of survivorship oh, okay. that the beneficiaries believe belongs to the estate. You know, in other words, perhaps it was set up um, as a matter of convenience to avoid probate fees. Mm -hmm. Um, but the executor's taking the position, no, 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 that's, that was a gift to me. So you can have a scenario there where the beneficiaries might say, this person isn't fit to represent the estate because he or she's in a conflict of interest. Have you ever had anybody come to the office, David, and say, well, here I am, I'm in a real pickle now, so my, my brother wanted me to be his executor, so I'm here to find out what an executor does, but i got to tell you, Mr. Lawyer, I'm not the least bit happy about this. I don't want to be his executor. Can I refuse? Well, you can't stop a person from writing your name in the will as an executor, um, but you don't have to accept the appointment. So when the person passes away and and you're named, you can say, I renounce, I, <coughs> I, don't, wish, I don't wish to be the executor. And, and then if the will doesn't provide for an alternate um, or, an, or another executor, might be a joint executor, then you can get into our administration problem where we need to have someone appointed. And if, do people if, if have second thoughts or get a little antsy about this and refuse, uh, say, thank you, it's very flattering, I appreciate your confidence in me as a human being, and I love you too, but I don't want to be your executor. Uh, can you do th is it better to do that to the individual that wants you to be, or do you wait until afterwards and decline then? What I, I, I think, surely, if, if you have a conversation with someone who's preparing a will and they say, would you be my executor and you don't want to be, then you definitely should tell them no, you thank you. You should say no right up front. And, and, and you would not expect them to put you in the will anyways. That would be unusual, but I suppose possible. But, but um, no, I think it's a good idea for people preparing wills and prospective executors to have a conversation and an understanding. And that gets back to knowing where the will is. And, mm -hmm. and also, in, in, in a good discussion, you would know about the estate. They'd say, here's where my banking is is and the, here's where my papers are and here's where my this and that are and make the administration easier so it's not a you know looking for uh, for something that you can't find. Ian it sounds like uh, communication is a pretty critical part of making things successful making the wheels turn uh, uh, through this whole process of probate and and the resolution of the estate and so on a and so if the individual that you want to be your executor doesn't want to accept the assignment better that that should be discussed up front way ahead of the game so you can make appropriate adjustments while you're still around and capable of doing that absolutely sterling and y you know it, it goes further than that because you may well want to first of all find out whether they're willing to do the job and if they are you can you can um, lay a lot of good organizational groundwork uh, while you're still alive. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, here's a copy of the will. The original's going to be here. 
here's a list of my bank accounts, what institution, what the account numbers are, and so forth. So you can really assist your executor while you're still alive with the task that he or she is taking on. And I suppose, and this goes back to an earlier question, David, if there is to be some compensation uh, for the assignment uh, that you take on as executor of this person's estate, perhaps that uh, should be uh, included in that initial conversation, whereas Ian says you can cover a lot of ground and be even more helpful than you imagined. And the compensation of executors is an area of dispute because um, if the will it doesn't specify specific compensation, it can be anywhere from zero to five percent of the gross value of the estate, and right. then there's a management fee on top of that for any income generated. And uh, so what happens is at the end of the administration, the executor says, well, I think I'll take four percent you know, and we might be talking about millions of dollars and 4% might be a lot of money. Yes. And the beneficiaries are going to say, well, that seems a bit rich to us. Um, you know, uh, tell me what you did and why are you why are you entitled? So that then becomes a fight because if the beneficiaries won't waive and, and, they, and won't agree to that account, then the, then the executor has to pass the account in front of the registrar of the Supreme Court and they have to basically prove their fee, which means proving all the work you did in the administration of that estate to justify that fee. Now, you mentioned, both of you <coughs> have mentioned already in the course of this program, that, uh, and it's very easy to imagine. Yeah, uh, th- that you know, uh, all of these uh, wills uh, don't get resolved amicably. There is sometimes some pretty strong emotion and uh, uh, well, some some nasty feelings uh, going back and forth. Uh, do executors uh, get sometimes caught in the crossfire? Uh, Ian, did sure. the, does this happen? Yeah, I mean, and and how do they handle it? Again, they they want they want they know. Okay, I'm going to be an executor. I'm in your office. This family, whoa, they're a wild bunch. I'm right in the middle of what I know is just going to be murderous crossfire. How do I survive? Has that happened? It it sure has, Sterling. And you know, one of the things that we we do see in our practice is um, sometimes, especially with the blended marriage, with a second marriage. So you have adult children from a first. Then you have a second spouse and his or her family. Sure. Um, and they're not getting along very well. And the deceased has appointed a close personal friend to sort of walk through the minefield, so mm-hmm. to speak, mm-hmm. because um, they're, they're relatively neutral to either side. But that, that person can be taking on a big headache dealing with, with people on either side. And to, to David's point about the idea that you can elect not to take the job, mm-hmm. uh, what you do is you, you actually file a document in the probate registry um, saying, I renounce. Oh, okay, I, because I, you've been named in the will, then right. you have to respond to that having been named. Right, but the point I want to make here is that you can't put your foot in the water and test the, test the temperature for too long before oh. you renounce. Oh, okay. Because if you start to act as an executor, um, it's called intermeddling, and you will not be able to renounce once you've once you've gone into the fray so to speak okay so, so once you're in you you got to make the call up front Th- exactly okay uh, and and uh, judging by the sage nod i'm getting from david here uh, not everyone does that and has uh, kind of chickens out after not only the toe but the entire foot up to the ankle is wet and that gets messy too doesn't it yeah no i i think people are well advised to get a little advice before they they start um because th- this concept of intermeddling, it's easy to trip into it. You you go to a bank or maybe you deal with the remains of the deceased or maybe you take a little step this way or that way and now you've committed right. and you can't you can't refuse the job now uh, easily. There are, there are some very unusual circumstances where you can get out, but but it's tough, and uh, now you're now you're you're in for a penny, in for a pound. Mm-hmm. This is you and the law here on AM 650. We're speaking with Vancouver <laughs> estate litigation lawyers David Hobbs and Ian Girodi from Hobbs Girodi, and learning more about executors, administrators, and wills and probate. And there's a lot left on this edition of You and the Law. So stay with us. We'll be right back. There's more of the show still ahead. This is You and the Law on AM 650. 